Hey Art History, this is going to be a two-part video um, for modern art between 1930 to 1950. And that's because the period is so packed with a lot of uh, things going on. Um, we tend to track the shift between the 20s and the 30s because of some political issues going on in Europe. Um, art movements continued during war-torn Europe. In the 20s, Germany and France had become centers of the avant-garde and cutting-edge modern art. Um, but by the 1930s, um, certain uh, political groups had started to uh, censor art. So in Germany, the kind of concept of degenerate art started, and, um, and basically Hitler labeled modern art movements as degenerate, cubism, surrealism, impressions, Dada, etc. Um, if you were labeled degenerate, um, you could not show, sell artwork. Um, they also would steal that artwork and confiscate it, and they actually held it in in, a, um, in a certain houses and caves and things like that during the war. Um, but if the artists were um, were spoke back against the um, structure, they could be killed. Um, so they were kind of a, a category of people, and many artists were actually also Jewish. So there was a kind of overlap as well as um, homosexual. So those were all people that were targeted by the Nazis. It was dangerous to be an artist in Europe. For that reason, you had a lot of um, artists fleeing on their own originally. Some also went into hiding. So very famously, Picasso and Matisse went into the French countryside and lived um, kind of there and really tried to um, hide when um, when Germany took over uh, Paris. Um, the In the Soviet Union, there was socialist realism and the Soviet Union began to censor art. So um, you couldn't have any um, abstract art in, uh, even though abstract art had been the start of the Soviet Union in the 19, uh, teens, it became um, a symbol of um, individualism in a way that they didn't like, so they kind of created this um, other type of art style. Many artists fled Berlin, Paris, Moscow, and other European art centers for New York City. Um, and then um, very famously, Peggy Guggenheim saved artists and thousands of works of art between 1936 and 1945. Peggy Guggenheim, seen right here, um, she was a socialite, um, but she was also part of the avant-garde movement. She kind of was a bohemian. She um, had been living in uh, Paris and was friends with Marcel Duchamp and was married actually at the time to Veil, another um, uh, surrealist artist. And um, she was Jewish. She used her money and her um, uh, connections to try and get as much art and people out of Europe as possible um, to um, also the danger of herself. There are several times where the Nazis actually were banging on her hotel room and she was going out the back door type of situation to try and get um, art onto ships and get out of there. Um, she did this from 1936 to 1945. Um, and then she settled the rest of her life in Venice in 1948. And there's a museum in the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice that holds a lot of her work too. All of this movement of art out of Europe spread ideas, um, especially continued trends of anti-authoritarian and the understandings of art um, into America and really had a big um, influence on global contemporary movements that we uh, see today. So the first kind of big uh, anti-authoritarian movement is surrealism. And the reason is that surrealism is all about the subconscious. Um, it takes a lot of concepts from psychology. The surrealists actually wrote treaties, treatises about um, their ideas. They, um, so we have, we, they're very well documented. Dali wrote a lot and spoke a lot about his art. Um, they all kind of hung out and were philosophical and psychological together, particularly living in Paris and then moving to New York. There's two types of surrealism. There's naturalistic surrealism. Images look close to nature in recognizable scenes, but out of sorts. Um, they're like recognizable, but not in the right order. Um, that's Dali and Magritte. And then there's biomorphic surrealism, which is automism, um, art without conscious control, and Jean Miro is an example of that. Um, what you want to do is look at this work of art and see if you see any recognizable things in art. So we can start basic with a sphere here. Arches bring back to classicism. This sculpture also brings back to classicism. Here you might see a train, which or a factory. Who knows? Um, it also has a lot of because the light is kind of uh, still in this picture, but everything seems off. Why is there a rubber glove hanging from a wall? Why is this sculpture head so big and hanging here? What is going on here? Um, what you'll see is that this is the work of um, Giorgio de um, 
Kiriko, Kiricho, <laughs> and he is an Italian, um, and it's a song of love from 1914. It's one of the earliest kind of surrealist artworks. He's kind of pulling together a bunch of things. It is a space we can recognize a little bit. It has some of the trademarks of Italian architecture um, and light, but it is it is a different scene. Max Ernst, who um, Peggy Guggenheim is um, actually saved. He actually was um, um, a Jewish artist who was uh, um, at risk for the Nazis and she helped him get out. Um, he made this in 1924. I often have kids look at this for a while and then try and figure out what's happening in the scene and you can really go into um, a lot of different theories, um, but it is surrealism so it, it it, even the name title might give you a hint, but it also might give you a whole new story. So I encourage you to try and make a story of what you're looking at right now. And then know that the title is called The Children Are Frightened by a Nightingale, which is a totally different kind of that, that gives a different tone. And he was a, very much about giving these kind of um, mysterious scenes and then give a title that would kind of give it an interesting tone. The surrealists were sort of famous for this. This is The Persistence of Memory by Dali. Um, and, um, you know, what that has to relate to this scene, you could really pull and talk and philosophize about it. But um, you have sort of this eye figure thing here that goes into nothingness. You have this like recognizable seascape back here, but it's sort of quiet. The water's quiet here. Uh, time is still stopped, it's melting away, and bugs are everywhere. So Dali definitely tried to push our kind of understanding of time and space um, and what is seen and known. And this is um, a dreamlike space that doesn't seem sort of like reality, but not. On our topics page, I'll put Dali's surrealism, a guest, a, a, I'm sorry, his guest experience on a TV show. It's very funny. They have to guess who it is, and, and he plays with them a lot, and you get to see a little bit of Dali's kind of funny personality. He was known to be kind of a goofball. This is Magritte. This is in written in French. It says, Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. This is called The Treachery of Images. It's from 1928 to 1929, oil and canvas. Magritte is trying to push the viewer to understand that modern art is not necessarily new because realistic art does not, is not exactly the object either. So this looks like a pipe, but is not a pipe. So we know it is art. So we do not need to pretend that art has to look like it, the reality. Reality and the object are separated in art. And so therefore it opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, and so he, he sort of kind of plays with these ideas. It's a very famous image. You'll see a lot of people writing this is and then something else. Um, and so just notice as this is not, and it's a play on um, the treachery of images, the idea that we get, we are too invested in images to look real. Um, here's another one of his, he's very easy to spot because um, Magritte often has sky scenes in his work, um, but he also has a very clean, clear brushstroke um, and he does a lot of incongruencies. So he layers the eye with the, um, the clouds. There's some famous ones with um, apples, um, like a person's face is an apple or things like that. He likes to mismatch things together. This is Jean Miro. Um, I have an interview with him um, if you want to look at it on the website. Um, and um, he did automism. So if you look at this, um, this is kind of the feeling that he had inside while he was creating the art. It doesn't have to look like an exact object that uh, his surrealism is more of an imagined kind of whatever the hand is telling him to do. Not precisely a surrealist, but often shown with them um, or grouped with them is Paul Klee. Klee uh, was Swiss. Um, he lived the end of his life in exile because he's considered a degenerate artist um, and was not, was denied his citizenship because of, um, of this um, issue. He um, did this in watercolor pen and ink on oil transfer paper um, and mounted on cardboard. So a lot of his works are kind of have this kind of pale, um, thinned out paint color in the background um, and with drawing on top. He His work was auto, automatic in style. Um, you can kind of see some natural elements like these look like 
these look like figures um, doing something, but then there's this windy thing and he calls it twittering machine is the work of art. And so then it brings in a whole nother image of what this could be. Um, his work also had some um, other kind of layering techniques as well as some natural elements like this uh, plant-like um, figure here. His work is very beautiful and quite interesting. So I encourage you um, to look at his work. Um, this is uh, Louis, uh, Louise Bourgeois. She's a French woman. Um, and um, this is Maman. She was um, lived with the Surrealists and often was um, underplayed for a long time, but people are now going back to her work and celebrating it. Um, she did a lot of these kind of like arachnid-like objects and sculptures. Um, and this is supposed to be kind of her over um, of her bearing mother. Um, she did not really have a lot of respect for her parents and that went into her art a lot. Her father had repeated affairs on her mother. And so a lot of people talk about, she's like a surrealist, but she puts in the scars of her childhood in, in the work. Um, and so, um, she would kind of try and do some things to scare, um, or shock people. So this one right here is a very shocking work, but she did a lot of things having to do with uh, body parts. So kind of very feminine or masculine body parts. Um, and body art is what, um, um, she sort of influenced, she influenced feminism, um, feminist art a lot. Um, and so these kind of surrealist sculptures really, um, bring into play this kind of fear and frustration with her, um, her growing up. Additionally, uh, during this period was the utopian styles was in the 19 teens during World War I and after. Um, this is suprematism, so it's taking down to the base of color and, to, and form and placing them against each other. Um, it influenced um, also Mondrian um, de Steele, so this is kind of taking also down these base colors and, and comparing them. You did a lot of this in your summer reading, so you know a lot about this already. Um, North America, a lot of the work during this period is influenced by the Works Progress Administration and the Depression. Americans were isolationists during 1930 to 1945, um, and they were doing a lot of the state-funded art. Um, so a lot of artists were going to the state to get a paycheck, so they were kind of doing things for the state. So for example, Dorothea Lange, a very famous artist, um, a photographer, actually started taking pictures um, to document the Depression. This is Migrant Mother. Um, just so you know, these children are um, staged in a certain way. She saw her face and thought that her face, Dorothy Lang thought that this mother's face was the the picture of um of the depression of kind of the the angst people were feeling, but she kind of set up the scene a little bit more so it would be um, kind of very uh, artistic. And so think about that when art uh, photographers are making their decision, they want you to have an impact and they're going to make decisions that do that. Um, this is Margaret Burke White, 1936. She did, um, she was known for these like sculpt, these like kind of overwhelmingly large, um, uh, different, you know, industrial scenes, very similar. You can compare this to my Egypt that we saw earlier. And then we have Edward Hopper here. Um, he was famous for kind of isolation and loneliness. Remember, um, think about the death of Marat and the use of the colors of a deep green, dark green, a light green, a red, and these kind of cold, sallow whites. So there's a blue green undertone in these whites that um, make you, these people feel even more alone. He also takes away anything from the street and the people to make people feel even more alone and isolated. There's no, tr there's no trees and natural life. There's no people on the street or in the other shops. There's no cars, nothing. It's all still. It's called night hawks. Um, then we have Jacob Lawrence. Um, Jacob Lawrence's uh, migration series was a grant that he earned or won. Um, and he had, um, he, he made the whole series together. There's about 60 paintings. Um, they're all about one, um, one and a half uh, feet by one feet. So it's just kind of, they're, they're just sort of small. Um, but they're quite beautiful. They're all done together around the same time and planned out. So um, they match in style. Um, tones, colors, everything like they, they work as a series together. Um, neither MoMA nor the Phillips could afford all of it. So that they did is they bought it in conjunction. Um, the series actually kind of, uh, uh, 
documents the migration of African Americans to the North in the 1920s. Um, his parents were part of the migration series and he actually was born on the migration. Um, and so there's a variety of scenes. It's a narrative. It's influenced by African art, Goya, Daumier, Aaron Douglas. It's historical painting depicting the migration. Um, it also it has some hard moments, but it also has a lot of things about family life and the dignity of 